There's been a great deal of talk about spirit of the game in recent months, some of it erudite, some of it hot air. Most recently, we were told that a 7-1 forwards back split on the Springbok bench for the Twickenham friendly against the All Blacks wasn't the done thing. Before that, we were told by certain sections of the English media that Alex Carey's run out of Johnny Bairstow was against the spirit of the game too. But what is the spirit of the game exactly? Does a notion that belongs to a time when sport was played by amateurs for the purposes of moral upliftment have relevance in today's sporting world? If it does, how does one define it? We all feel that we know it when we see it, but we also recognize that it's not a law, so those who are found wanting in its application can't be sanctioned. Why bother if it seems so nebulous? Through a series of anecdotes, in this week's podcast, we have a long, hard look at that slippery sporting notion, the spirit of the game. Welcome to The Luke Alfred Show. I have 30 years of experience on the front lines of sports journalism, covering some of the biggest games in cricket, rugby, the FIFA World Cup, and even the Olympic Games. Come and join me as we learn about some of the greatest sports stories you've never heard. I'm Luke Alfred, and welcome to the show. Confession time. Many fans of a certain generation assumed that the phrase spirit of the game had gone the way of BG Continental soccer boots, linseed oil with which to rub your cricket bat, and wooden tennis rackets. If so, we were mistaken. We were more than simply mistaken, we were sadly mistaken, because the phrase has made a fitful but unmistakably present reappearance in 2023. Rare but much commented upon sightings, should that not perhaps be soundings, of the phrase have occurred recently in London, first at Lords, where Alex Carey stumped Johnny Besto in the second Ashes Test, leading to an unseemly kerfuffle in the members' pavilion. A couple of months later and the phrase had jumped across the River Thames. It was heard at Twickenham in South London, where the Springbok Brains Trust of Jacques Ninoba and Rassi Erasmus first introduced a controversial 7-1 forwards-back split on the Bok bench. Their fiddling with a more normal 5-3 split, or even a 6-2 split, brought the phrase out of hibernation for the Friday night 35-7 friendly victory over the All Blacks and, rather like a Canaan Moody intercept, it has been covering a great deal of ground ever since. The Springbok win against the Blackness certainly set the cat amongst the World Cup pigeons. Rugby folks still have widely divergent views on what it means in the broader scope of things, although such uncertainty won't last forever. Sooner rather than later, the 35-7 will be forgotten amidst the hullabaloo of what's happening at the business end of the tournament and whether the box are playing their quarterfinal in Paris or Marseille. More recently, the phrase has been seen and heard in the vicinity of Edinburgh and Glasgow. It has been put to good use by former Scottish players and pundits who argue, ahead of the Springboks World Cup opener against Scotland on Sunday, that stacking the bench with players like Archia Sneeman and Vincent Koch is against the spirit of the game, adding a little ridiculously that the 7-1 split is, quote, abusing the bench. How exactly one is entitled to ask does one abuse a bench? Do you shout at it very loudly, raise your hand and send it to its room? As far as I am aware, I could of course be wrong, the bench itself has no thoughts whatsoever about how many forwards and how many backs are sitting upon it. A defence of the 7-1 split has, however, come from an unexpected quarter. No less a man than the Yoda of the world game, Eddie Jones, has been quoted recently as saying, quote, Tradition maybe says 5-3, but that doesn't mean it's right. I applaud South Africa for being so bold and courageous in the way they want to play. That is great innovation. Yes, Eddie has shied away from using the phrase under discussion, but we all know exactly what he's talking about, don't we? Instead of talking about spirit of the game, Canny Eddie has used a slightly less dubious word, tradition. 
This strikes me as a prudent idea because it is singularly less overloaded than talking about the spirit of the game. The word tradition deepens the conversation and takes some of the stuffy piety and emotional heat out of it. Let's not forget that it was once traditional to play football with five forwards, three midfielders and two backs. It was traditional for a scrum half to dive past. It was traditional for batsmen to wear caps and it was traditional to call batsmen batsmen. Eight ball overs were traditional as were separate entrances to change rooms for amateurs and professionals. Long tours were traditional and they started off with long voyages full of long days and long nights on which it was traditional to play deck quets and, as light entertainment in the evening, dress up in woman's clothing and strum the ukulele. It was once traditional to walk if you nicked off, saving the umpire the trouble and demonstrating your good sportsmanship and chummy regard for the pieties of the game. It was once traditional, not to say usual, for Ali Bacha to use the word historic in every second or third sentence and try and use it more regularly than that if he possibly could. So Jones is right. Traditions are dynamic. They change. They change organically. We can change with them or be left behind, taking refuge in platitudinous phrases like spirit of the game, which might finally count for less than we sometimes think they do. Before we go any further with this podcast, however, let's clarify our terms and check up on what Rugby's Law 3, number 8, says about eight players on the bench. In this regard, I sought out the former referee, Freak Berger, and his expert view and his expert view was that there is only one stipulation as far as the eight players on the bench are concerned, and that is that three of them must be a replacement front row. Quote, Three or four years ago, the laws were changed with respect to the safety and welfare of the players, and the number on the bench was upped to eight, said Berger. At that stage, it was five players on the bench, of which three had to be forwards. There is discussion about lowering the eight back down to five, but that's certainly not going to impact upon things at the World Cup, and it's a discussion for another day. A 7-1 forwards backs bench split might be contrary to the spirit of the game, but this aside, it is risky. In the all-black friendly at Twickenham, the only backline player on the bench was Kurbis Reinach. The scrum half is as versatile as a packet of wet wipes, but he's not so versatile that he could have taken kicking duties over from Miney Lubbock had Lubbock left his kicking tea in Humansdorp, the little eastern Cape Town from which he comes. Should Lubbock find place kicking duties too onerous, such duties will need to be handled by Fuck de Klerk or Cheslin Colby. You would think that to go into the Springboks opener against Scotland in a day's time, with a 7-1 split would be a big gamble. Perhaps 6-2, with the extra backline place going to Damien Willemser, who can play at full back if Vili LaRue comes off after a good run. Willemser can also play at fly half or even on the wing. There's also a case to be made for finding a place on the bench for a floater like Quacha Smith. The former Lions flank has played so much sevens rugby that he can float between offering cover to both forwards and backs. It's not ideal, because Smith is most comfortably a flank, but, if need be, he could play on the wing. He gives you options. Are we being unkind, I wonder, to the idea of spirit of the game? Is the issue here contextual, in that the phrase is so often used with an undertow of piety, as was the case when Carey either stumped or ran out the happy wanderer, Besto. So often the phrase seems to be either implicitly or explicitly associated with self-congratulation. Those who use it are almost always making a mad dash for the moral high ground, the flag of the country they favour held firmly in one hand. But are we prepared to throw out the idea of spirit of the game entirely, I somehow think not. I like to think it means something. If it disappeared completely, 
I think sport would be worse off without it, although you could counter that its disappearance would probably take some time to register, and when it was gone, it would truly be gone forever. Then again, does the phrase ever disappear entirely? Isn't the phrase's occasional appearance or reappearance significant? Doesn't it speak of a residual hankering for fair play, for a code of honour above and beyond the laws of the game that speaks to sportsmen and women as moral agents with an inherited sense of natural justice? The Marleybone Cricket Club, otherwise known as the MCC, have a spirit of the game stipulation as a preamble to the laws. In 2000, at the behest of Ted Dexter and Sir Colin Cowdery, both former England captains, the laws were expanded for the first time to include Cowdery and Dexter's thinking on the spirit of the game. In part, their 2000 additions to the laws read as follows. Quote, Cricket is a game that owes much of its unique appeal to the fact that it should be played not only within its laws, but also within the spirit of the game. Any action which is seen to abuse this spirit causes injury to the game itself. In early 1974, the England cricket team toured the West Indies. In their midst was a Queenstown-born South African all-rounder called Tony Gregg, who had made his debut for England against Australia at Old Trafford in 1972. By the time Greg arrived in the Caribbean, he had already toured India and Pakistan, but this was his first encounter with the might of the Windies in their backyard. He was keen, perhaps a little too keen, to show what he could do. The first test was at Trinidad's port of Spain. England had batted poorly on the first day, and on the second, the West Indies had passed their meagre total with wickets in hand. The final over of the day was bowled by the left-arm spinner, Derek Underwood, to the best West Indies bowler batsman, Bernard Julian. Alvin Kalicharan was at the non-striker's end, not out on 142, the total a commanding 274 for six for the Windies. As we all know, it is anathema to lose your wicket off the last ball of the day in a test match, more so for those who can't bat than for those who can, and Julian dutifully prodded Underwood's delivery away with a rapt, tongue-in-the-teeth concentration. The ball rolled to Greg, who was fielding at Silly Madoff. Greg gathered the ball and noticed that Kalicharan had wandered well out of his crease. The umpire at the bowler's end Douglas Sang Hugh hadn't called time, although the England wicketkeeper Alan Knott had pulled the stumps from the ground in the expectation of play being called for the day. With Kalicharan well out of his ground, Greg shied at the stumps at the non striker's end and hit them. After a moment's indecision, Sang Hugh gave Kalicharan out. Kalicharan, looking forward to having a shower and putting his feet up, was stunned. So too were the scoreboard operators. At first they changed the scoreboard to seven wickets down. They were listening to the radio commentary at the same time, however, and the commentators were of the view that Knott's picking up of the stumps constituted an end to the day's play. Greg's throwing down of the stumps was invalid and, following the commentator's lead, the scoreboard operators changed the wickets down column down. They changed it down to six. The local crowd was not best pleased. They were so not best pleased, in fact, that they were angry. There was a threatened riot. A small pocket of them didn't want to go home. Were the home sites six or seven wickets down? Nobody seemed to know. In expectation of trouble, Gary Sobers personally drove Greg, seen by many fans to be a mercenary white South African, although he was playing for England, back to the England Hotel to ensure that he was safe. No harm would come to Greg if he was being driven in Sobers' car. The next day was a rest day, so there was no play. This gave the England management an opportunity to consider the rashness or otherwise of Greg's actions. 
England's tour manager, Donald Carr, had much to think about. They were in the early stages of a five-test series, and it might not be advisable to start the tour off on the wrong note. There were diplomatic, racial and emotional sensitivities to consider. What should they do? Kalicharan, of Tamil descent and five years younger than his Guyanese compatriot in the West Indies side, Clive Lloyd, had batted beautifully and was a thorn in England's flesh. But was his wicket worth jeopardising an entire tour for? My guess is that Greg, a hot-blooded competitor at the best of times, would have needed some convincing that what he did was contrary to the spirit of the game, but we don't know this for sure. In later interviews, Greg has always maintained that what he did was permissible and, as Sang Hugh hadn't called time, and that he had his back to the wicketkeeper not, so didn't see him pull out the stumps, he was well within his rights to throw down Kalicharan's stumps. What we can say for certainty is that before the start of the third day's play, after the rest day, England's appeal was withdrawn. Their skipper, Mike Dines, read a prepared statement in which he said, quote, Greg in no way intended his instinctive actions to be contrary to the spirit of the game. Greg and Kalicharan, who were an incongruous sight, by the way, Greg being the tallest member of the England team, Kalicharan being the shortest member of the West Indian team, shook hands at the beginning of the next day's play. The tour was back on track. Once reinstated, Kalicharan went on to make 158 in 334 balls, helping the home side to a first innings lead of 261. Thanks to Dennis Amos, who had an exceptional tour with the bat, England made 392 in their second dig, leaving the West Indies only 130-odd to win batting last. They successfully negotiated a tricky period and won the test by seven wickets. Tests in Kingston, Bridgetown and Georgetown were drawn, so by the time it came to the fifth test, which was back at Port of Spain, where the Greg Kalicharan incident happened, England needed a win to square the series. They batted first after winning the toss. Jeff Boycott scored 99 in their paltry 267. In reply, the West Indies scored 305, Lawrence Rowe scoring 123, a lead of 38. Although Boycott scored the century that had eluded him in the first innings, scoring 112, England could only muster a scarcely match-winning 263 scored in four balls less than 150 overs. The final test was played over six days, presumably to encourage a result, and given that England had sacrificed a first innings lead and hadn't scored heavily in their second, a West Indies victory was on the cards. They only needed 226 for a win, not a copy, but not a mountain either. In the end, they were bowled out 26 runs short, and so drew the series. Chief destroyer, you ask? Well, that was Greg, bowling off spinners. He took 8 for 86 in the West Indian first innings and 5 for 70 in the second, to give him a match analysis of 13 for 156. Here was a man who had serial difficulties in staying out of the game. One of the assumptions in Test Cricket in 1974 was that there was something called the spirit of the game, and that this spirit could be violated. It could be violated by cynically taking advantage of the room for limited movements on the edge of the laws. I've looked at the stills of the final ball from Underwood, and I'm struck by the idea that Greg knows Kalicharan has a habit of wandering out of his crease, and he's just waiting for an opportunity to pounce. Then again, maybe Greg... Noticing that Alvin was out of his ground, noticed only in the moment. We'll never know. So where do we line up on this one? Are we world-weary cynics? Of the view that there are referees and umpires, and they have all kinds of visual aids to help them with everything from offsides in football to forward passes in rugby. Forward passes, I might mention, that they frequently get wrong, 
if my vantage point on the couch is anything to go by? Or are we the backward-looking romantics, the tragics, who don't make a case for spirit of the game for fear of embarrassing ourselves in front of our more jaded and urbane friends? Is it unacceptable to say I have a foot in either camp? Well, it probably is. I do admit, though, that the bigger of my two feet rests with the tragics. I like the idea of being surprised by a rare instance of spirit of the game. I like the idea of decency and camaraderie and mateship. I like the idea that although it seldom makes much of an appearance, very occasionally we might get a sighting and are possibly better off for it. There are problems with this, however. In the MCC quote I referenced earlier, we heard that an action contrary to the spirit of the game is an injury to the game itself. How can this be? And who is to say? And who is to say what constitutes an injury? Presumably the very people who introduced the notion as a preamble to the rejigged laws in 2000, the MCC in other words, will be doing the saying. And what will they say? They will say that in their view, Kerry's action against Bairstow was against the spirit of the game. Wow, that's knocked my MCC cap right off my head. Those repercussions are going to be felt across the cricket playing world. They might even be felt deep into the universe. In their next breath, the MCC will also be forced to confess that although the Cowdery Dexter preamble has been incorporated into the MCC's laws of the game, it isn't in fact a law. One cannot break a law that isn't a law, so it therefore follows that one cannot be punished, for example, for abusing the spirit of the game. So there we have it. There we have the horrible ambiguity with the notion of the spirit of the game, the idea that wants to be a law but which, in actual fact, is only a moral idea about a game which is neither alive in the traditional sense nor has a spirit. Perhaps it is a question of knowing where to look. In the Greg runout of Kalicharan anecdote I told earlier, I found myself charmed by Sobers having the kindness and the presence of mind to take Greg back to the England hotel in his car. It was a spirit of the game moment, but probably wasn't seen as such because it didn't happen on the field of play, which is a pity. I would have liked to have been an invisible passenger in Sober's car and eavesdropped on their conversation. They didn't talk about the runout, I bet. If you enjoyed this episode of The Luke Alfred Show, please like, share, follow and subscribe. I write full scripts for the show in the form of long-form essays and these are all available on my Substack. To get written episodes of The Luke Alfred Show a day early on Fridays, please check out The Luke Alfred Substack. You can hear The Luke Alfred Show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I release a new episode every Saturday at 10.30 a.m. 